morning, everyone, uh, both the audience present in the seminar room today and those uh, um, connected online. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce Michelle Doherty. Uh, Michelle is Professor of Space Physics at Imperial College London. Uh, she was principal investigator of the, uh, with the uh, magnetometer instrument of the Cassini mission to Saturn. And Michelle um, uh, informed us about this mission uh, several years ago. And she's also principal investigator uh, with, of the ma ma magnetometer instrument in the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. This is known as JUICE. Uh, JU stands for Jupiter, IC for Icy, and E for Explorer. Um, this was launched at the end of April 19, uh, at the end of April 2023. And one morning at breakfast, I heard it on the news. So the, all of Africa will know, South Africa will know about um, juice. Now, Michelle was born in the heart of Africa, that is Johannesburg. In her early years, she spent in, moved, the family then moved down to Natal, the then province of Natal. And uh, Michelle attended the University of Natal and got the BSc Honours in Applied Mathematics, and then did a PhD under the supervision of Professor Jim McKenzie, who has a, had an international McKenzie, who had an international who had an international reputation in space science, got an excellent grounding in space science. Now, um, at present, uh, Michelle is head of physics of the physics department at Imperial College. Uh, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of London and has received many awards. Uh, the Royal Astronomical Society Geophysics Gold Medal in 2017 and uh, the CBE in the UK 2018 New Year's Honours List and also the Institute of Physics Richard Glazebrook Gold Medal and Prize. Michelle's kept in contact with South Africa over the years, and for that, uh, she was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of South Africa. Now, Michelle, we'd like to invite you to present your seminar. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you today about JUICE um, and my invo involvement in JUICE. And one of the things about being involved in outer planetary missions is you need a huge amount of patience to do so. We first started thinking and talking about a mission to Jupiter 15 years ago. And from my perspective, we're now halfway through. The mission has just been launched. It's going to take us six and a half years to get there. And then by the time we get to the end of the mission and have taken the last bits of data, it will be another 15 years time. And so in some ways, I see JUICE as a way of paying back for my involvement in Cassini because I wasn't involved in building the instrument for Cassini, but I was able to do all the great science. And so I've got lots of young people on my team who are going to help us analyze the data. So this view here shows you uh, an artist's impression of um, the spacecraft itself. So I've got my pointer out showing you the spacecraft. And in the background is Ganymede, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. And we're going to focus a lot on Ganymede. We're actually going to go into orbit around Ganymede. And one of the things that we want to understand is this blue area in the interior. We're almost certain there is a liquid water ocean at Ganymede. And using the instrument that I'm responsible for, we're going to be able to measure not only what the depth of that ocean is, but what its salt content is and whether it's a global ocean. You can also see Jupiter in the background and the magnetic field lines of Jupiter. You can see Europa in the bottom left corner. And you can see Callisto, which is one of the other moons, right in the background as well. And so I'm going to, as we go through the slides today, I'm going to talk you through how it is we're going to make the observations that we would like to make. 
But before I do that, you here I wanted to show you because it, it's this, um, the internal structure of these four moons of Jupiter was based on measurements that were made by the Galileo spacecraft and NASA spacecraft, which went into system back in the late 1990s. And based on the observations from the magnetic field measurements and from the gravity measurements at these moons, it was clear that there was liquid water underneath the surfaces of Europa, of Ganymede, which is going to be the focus of my spacecraft, and of Callisto as well. And so it was these observations, as well as observations which the Cassini spacecraft made at Saturn and its moons, that led us to the realization sorry, I've now, now got it working, here we go, led us to the realization, which I think is, is probably one of the most important realizations planetary scientists have come to in the last 30 years. And that is, if you're looking for liquid water in the solar system, you don't have to be close to the sun. You can be very far away from the sun, but you won't find liquid water on the surface, you'll find it underneath the surface. So let me give, give you an idea about what, we, what we're actually looking at here. So here on the y-axis, we're looking at the mass of the star in our, either our solar system or outside re, re, relative to the mass of the sun. So that's the sun there. And then on the x-axis, we're looking at the radius of the orbit of whatever planet we're looking at relative to the earth. And so prior to the last 30 years, if we were looking for liquid water, we would always focus close to the sun. So we know we've got liquid water on the surface of the earth. We also looked at Mars, and there's been a lot of spacecraft that have gone to Mars to try and see if there was liquid water on the surface. They haven't found it, but they found evidence of it in the past. But for me, one of the most important discoveries that we've made is that you can go beyond the line. And that's it. If you find liquid, if you find water on the surface, it's going to be ice because it's so cold, but you can search underneath the surfaces and find liquid underneath. And so Jupiter, I'm going to talk much more about that today. We think at least three of the moons of Jupiter have got the liquid water ocean under the surface. And then discoveries that we made with the Cassini spacecraft confirmed there was liquid water outgassing from the south pole of one of the moons called Enceladus, but there's also liquid water under the surface of Titan. And so it, this slide here was one that we used to present to the European Space Agency to make the case for why we wanted to send a spacecraft mission to Jupiter. And I think if we hadn't been able to pr present a slide like this, we probably wouldn't have been able to persuade them that this was something that was worth doing. What I wanted to do was to, was to show you some slides linked to getting ready for building the instrument to go to Jupiter. I'll show you some slides of the launch as well. Um, and then I'll talk about the science that we're going to do. But this slide, slide here essentially shows you all the different elements of the JUICE program. So I'm going to uh, focus on a slide talking about the spacecraft itself uh, uh, in a short while. But this shows you a view of what the spacecraft looks like. Those large appendages sticking out from the side are the solar panels. And so the way that we're going to run the instruments on JUICE is via solar power. So when we were launched, the solar panels were folded away and it was only after launch we were able to deploy them. And the spacecraft was built by Airbus based in Germany and in France. And on the spacecraft, there are 10 different instruments and I'm responsible for one of them, which is the magnetometer. There are ground stations, which the European Space Agency operates because what happens is once a day, the spacecraft turns to the earth and sends the data down to the earth. There's a missions to operate the race center, which is based in Mamstadt in Germany, and that's how the instruments and the spacecraft is actually operated. And I've spent some time there in the last couple of months watching our instrument being turned on and watching the boom that we put our instrument on be deployed. There's another center in um, Madrid, a science center, where all the data comes down and that then gets sent to all the different PIs. Of course, the science community has a very large involvement because we're going to be using the data and analyzing it and trying to understand what it's telling us. And then last but not least, the spacecraft was launched on an Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana. And I went out to French Guiana for the launch and it was scary. The first day, uh, uh, we were 10 minutes away from launch and they were doing the countdown and they sent some balloons up into the atmosphere just above the launch site, just to check that everything was okay. And they found lightning. 
in the upper atmosphere. So they scrapped the launch. You don't want to send a 1.5 billion euro spacecraft through a lightning storm. So it was delayed for 24 hours. And luckily it then went off the following day. And I've got, I've got a picture of the launch for you. <laughs> this shows you a closer up view of the spacecraft itself. Um, these are the solar panels. And in total, they um, are 76 square meters. Of, but could out of Jupiter, the solar radiation is not very strong. The solar panels to degrade over time. So the amount of power we get is going to get less over time. The most important instrument, which is mm -hmm. mine, and of course I would say that, is based on this very long boom. So what we do is we want to make sure we get, get as far away from base field we made three different sensors, two of them very close to the end of the boom, one about uh, two thirds of the way down. And this boom was deployed, show you a little which shows all of the appendages being deployed. This umbrella shaped is the high gain antenna, that's what points to the earth once a day and sends the data down. There's an optical bench where there are lots of um, instruments that are able to take in, uh, the, in the visible and in the infrared, and then behind the spacecraft, there are other instruments as well. Next slide. <clears throat> so this shows you um, some views of the instrument itself. And I think for me, one of the things I'm most proud of is that during lockdown, we were able to, able to build a flight instrument. The spacecraft was built during lockdown as well. And in fact, you know, when we first went into the first COVID lockdown, the labs closed. We had to send everyone home. My engineers took bits of the instrument home with them and were building it on their kitchen table. That was the first model that we built. Usually you build three different models and um, each of them gets more and more, gets closer and closer to the final model that we're going to fly. But let me just show you what we have here. So as I said, there are three different instruments. This is the Fluxgate magnetometer, which we build at Imperial College. This is another Fluxgate magnetometer which our colleagues and our OIs in Germany build. And then we have a third sensor, which is right on the end of the boom. That only measures the, mag the magnitude of the magnetic field, and that was built by colleagues in Austria. And then last but not least, we've got this black box here. That's the electronics box. All of the electronics for the instruments goes into that box. And that box actually sits on the spacecraft, so it's more protected from the radiation environment. Some of the scary things you do when you're building an instrument is you need to test that it can survive launch. The vibrations of launch are really strong. And so this is a picture of the of the e-box on a vibration table, and so it shakes. And the final model survived. The first model didn't. There were bits flying off it. And so we realized we had to be a bit more careful as to how we put things in. And then this picture here is even scarier. So there's the e-box. And here is a, 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 a long, hard piece of steel, which is dropped down on top of the e-box. That's called the shock test. And that's to check and see whether the instrument will survive that as well. All was well. Oh, that one worked. I got all excited because, mm. sorry, can I go back one, I think? The, okay, perfect. So this is the view of the, um, of the spacecraft. It was packed away and put into this large container so it could be put on the aircraft that would take it out to French Guyana. And um, the view that you have here shows um, the high gain antenna, which is covered up. That covering was deployed after it was launched. So this shows you a view of the nose of the, of the aircraft being opened up and the juice spacecraft coming out, being lifted onto a lorry, which would then take it to the launch site. The next slide, please. And this shows you the spacecraft at the launch site itself, and they were getting the spacecraft ready to actually go onto the top of the rocket. One of the reasons I like to show this view is you can see the magnetometer boom that my instruments are on deployed away because you can't launch a spacecraft with a large boom sticking off from the side. So there were three parts to it and they were folded up, as you can see here, and then deployed after launch. I'll talk about a space mission without showing the launch. So this shows you two different pictures from the launch. So the spacecraft is, is put into this top part of the launcher here. 
and then once it leaves the Earth's gravitational field in the Earth's atmosphere, that opens up, and then the spacecraft operates under its own under its own engine. This white light I particularly like because they always put a camera really close by to the launch site, and the camera is sending real data back because it always gets burnt up, and so that's essentially the last view that that camera took before it before it burnt up as a result of being so close to the launch but the launch was so successful and it, op it operated as well as we wanted it to that we now have spare fuel on the spacecraft that's going to allow us to get much closer to ganymede which is the moon that we're going to be focusing on next slide please okay this is a little movie it doesn't have any sound but so this yes if if, if you could get a Great. So what this movie shows is once we were launched and we left the spacecraft, all the appendages were then deployed. So this shows you the um, solar uh, the solar panels being deployed one side at a time. This happened about 40 minutes after launch. And so we all sat there biting our nails because if this hadn't happened, we wouldn't have had a full suit. We, we wouldn't have been able to power the instrument into the spacecraft. They move, they orient themselves so they're getting the full sunlight. And we then had to dial them down because they're so powerful it was too strong. We had too much power. There was then something called the radar antenna, which you can see slowly deploying. This was a very complex deployment. And in fact, this deployment didn't work first time. It took six weeks for us to get this to actually deploy properly. And it just was a reminder to us of how scary space is. Things don't always work the first time. So this, this is now finally deployed. And then the most important deployment, the mag boom deployment, you can see it starting there. And I've actually got some to show you from out as the boom deployed. And then lots of other antennas started deploying. So it took about six weeks for us to get to the stage where all the various appendages of the spacecraft had deployed, and we were then in in flight in flight readiness. Um, I think there's one last one, and then that's it. So now the spacecraft and all the instruments are ready. I then spent some time in 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 Germany, not not only the boom deployed, but also. A week later, we turned all of our instruments on one by one. We tested them out. We tested them at different temperatures just to make sure that everything was operating. Because, you know, you, you build an instrument, you spend nine years building an instrument, then go to this new rocket, and you hope it's going to slide the launch. But luckily, it clearly has. So next slide, please. So this shows you data from the boom deployment. So um, what we're looking at here is the strength of the magnetic field on the y-axis, and along the x-axis, we're looking at time. And this was the this is what the spacecraft looked like when the boom wasn't deployed. So you can see it essentially fold away here. And two of our instruments were taking data, and the magnitude from the instrument that we built at Imperial College was 10,000 10, nanosphere, an extremely high field. And the reason for that is the way that the boom was deployed is it was right up next to the spacecraft thrusters and they were generating that huge field. And you would very much hope as, as the boom deployed, that field would drop to almost zero. And you can see that happening. As the boom deployed over a period of about 15 seconds, the field drops down to almost zero. And here we're measuring the solar wind field. And so that was the first sign that the boom deployment had gone well. And so this is what the configuration of the spacecraft looked like after that. This is the longest boom that the European Space Agency has ever built. It's 10.6 meters in length. And we needed to do that because there's so many different instruments on the spacecraft, they generate lots of fields of their own. And so we needed to get as far away from the spacecraft as we could so that we weren't measuring any of those. You can only, you have to be a magnetometer person to be excited by a plot like this. But what this is showing you is this is when we tested our instrument out. So I told you there were three different sensors that we had. You can see they're all measuring the same. What we've done is we've moved them away from each other so you can see them. Those three colors is data from the three different sensors. If you overlay them on top of each other, they're measuring exactly the same thing. So all the all three instruments are working and we've now been left on. So as all the in other instruments are turned on, we are, we are being left on so we can see if they're having any effect on our data. And so far, none of them have. And so it's very clear 
a lot of work went into keeping the spacecraft as electromagnetically clean as they could. So now we can be sure the data we're measuring is coming from the environment and not from. Okay, let me talk to you a bit about the science now. So we're going to do a huge amount of science at Jupiter. There's a whole range of things that we're going to focus on. But this is really an overview slide describing to you all the different aspects that we're going to be looking at. So there are instruments on board that are going to focus on Jupiter itself. They're going to remotely sense the atmosphere. They're going to get an understanding about how the atmosphere is changing over time. We also think that Jupiter's atmosphere will give us better understanding about the formation of the Jupiter system and the solar system in general. We are also going to be looking at the magnetosphere. Now, so what the magnetosphere is, is any planet that has a magnetic field will interact with the environment around it and this large cavity forms. And that cavity protects the planet from the effect of the solar wind, for example. So on the Earth, our magnetic field protects us from energetic particles from the solar wind. Something very similar happens at Jupiter, but it's more complicated at Jupiter because Jupiter has a moon that also has a magnetic field. And so, and I'll talk about this a bit later. I don't know if you can see it here. I can't see it very well at all, but you have a mini magnetosphere inside the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And I'll, there's a slide that shows that a bit better. But for me, the real unique aspect of the JUICE mission is the focus that we're going to have on the moons of Jupiter. We're going to focus on three of the moons, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and all three of these, we're going to get a better understanding of the ocean underneath the surface. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth oh, do we care if there's a liquid water ocean? Well, if you're looking for life elsewhere in the solar system or potential habitability, just are the ingredients there for life, you need there to be three things. You need there to be liquid water, you need there to be a heat source, and you also need all, you need organic material. And so the first ingredient we look for is liquid water, and we're almost sure we have them at three of the moons. Okay, so let's focus on these three moons. And so these are the three that um, Juice is going to focus on. Let me first start with Europa, actually. So it's really interesting. When we first started talking about uh, going to Jupiter, um, there was going to be a joint mission between NASA and ESA. So NASA was going to build a Europa orbiter spacecraft. ESA was going to build the Ganymede Orbiter. And we had almost got to the stage where we were ready to present the mission to ESA and to NASA. And NASA then said they couldn't do it. They couldn't afford to do it. So they pulled out. So ESA then asked us to study a European only mission. And so this is what we've now come up with, JUICE. But once JUICE was selected and we began to build it, NASA said, oh no, we, we also want to come as well. And so they are now building a mission called Europa Clipper. Europa Clipper is going to fly past Europa about 50 times. And we know there is a deep ocean world, an ocean world at Europa. We think it might be active as well. We think there might be some regions on the surface where water might be coming up from the surface. And I'll actually show you some slides that uh, show that. But also for Europa, we think the liquid might be in contact with the silicate mantle in the deep interior, and that might be a way that organic material might be coming out onto the surface. So JUICE will have two early flybys of Europa, and then we will move to be focusing on Callisto. Callisto is a rather strange body. We don't think it's differentiated in the interior. You can see the structure looks a bit different. We don't think there's a solid core. And we also, from observations from previous spacecraft, <laughs> the surface seems to be really old. So we think by being able to study the surface of Callisto with some of the instruments on board JUICE, we're going to be able to get an idea of all the different impacts that have taken place in its history. If you look closely, you can see there's this blue region in the interior. Based on magnetic field measurements from Galileo, we're almost certain, again, that there is this global liquid water ocean at Callisto. And using my instrument on JUICE, we're going to be able to not only confirm that, but get an idea about its depth and its conductivity. But our real focus, and at the end of the mission, we're actually going to go into orbit around Ganymede. And with the extra fuel that we have because of the fantastic launch, we're going to go really close. We're going to go probably 200 kilometers above the surface and we're going to go into circular orbit. Now, Ganymede is interesting because not only is it the largest moon in the solar system, it's similar in size to Mercury. 
It also has, we're almost certain it has a deep ocean. And I keep saying, I, I, I'm, I want to say it has, but we still need to confirm it. And the reason I say that is that the Galileo spacecraft, which flew past Ganymede, I think on eight separate occasions, made measurements which it couldn't model with an ordinary internal dynamo field. It had to be quite a weird dynamo field. That was one way to be able to model it. The other way to model it was if you had an internal dynamo like we have on the Earth, but you had induction signatures flowing in the ocean. But we need to confirm that. So on our first two early flybys of Ganymede, we will be able to confirm whether or not we do have an ocean. I'm 95% sure that we do, but we need to be able to confirm that. Now, one of the reasons why Ganymede is so unique is it's the only moon in the solar system that has its own internal planetary field. And so if you're a magnetometer person like I am, it's a sort of place you want to go. You've got the magnetic field of Jupiter, you've got the magnetic field of Ganymede, and then you want to measure these little signals in the interior. Now, you also might be thinking, how on earth can a magnetometer measure electrical currents flowing in an ocean? Well, the way that that happens, if, if we have a conducting body and we've got a magnetic field that is changing around it, that, make, that changing field induces electrical currents that flow in the conducting body. Those electrical currents generate a magnetic field of their own, and that's what we're not able to measure. But it's going to be really difficult, and I'll show you why it's going to be difficult. When I lose sleep, that's what I lose sleep over as to whether we're going to be able to do it or not. So this shows you what it is that my instrument is going to do. It's going to measure the strength of the induction fields in the ocean, count what the depth of the oceans are and what the conductivity of the water is. I've already mentioned we're going to work out what the internal dynamo field of Ganymede is. And by being able to do that, that allows us to almost see inside the planet to get an understanding of the internal structure. And then, as I've mentioned, we're going to be able to compare a differentiated body where we've got these different layers on the inside to an undifferentiated body. Top right shows you the different types of interiors that there might be. Number one shows you nice the way down to the, uh, to the interior. Number two shows you a very thick ice crust, liquid water, and then another ice crust. Three shows you again a, a thick ice crust, but then the liquid water goes all the way down to the silicate mantle. And then four shows you a very thin ice crust and a very deep liquid water ocean. And that's what we need to try and understand. We need to be able to try and differentiate all of those. This here focuses on what we're going to do in the general environment of Jupiter. And I thought I had a slide that showed this better, and it does. So, um, some uh, magnetic field measurements are crucial to understand all the different plasma processes that are, are taking place. And so it's, it's really important for the other instruments to be able to understand the observations that they're going to make. Now, one of the, one of the things about Jupiter, we can see Jupiter here, and you can see the white lines of the, mag of the magnetic field lines of Jupiter. There's a huge amount of plasma in the equatorial region at Jupiter. And that plasma stretches the magnetic field lines away from the planet. And as the planet rotates, those field lines are going to be wobbling up and down. And it's those wobbling field lines that give you the change in field that causes induction signals at Ganymede. But as we have northern and southern lights at the Earth, you've got something similar at Jupiter. And so we are going to be able to measure and examine the aurora that we see at the North Pole and the South Pole of Jupiter. You can also see footprints of the moons in the aurora as well. This is what I was talking about earlier. This is the magnetosphere of Jupiter with the blue line showing you the magnetic field lines of Jupiter. But embedded within the magnetosphere of Jupiter, you have Ganymede in its own magnetosphere. So this is really unique. You've got a mini magnetosphere embedded inside Jupiter's. And last but not least, because Ganymede has a magnetic field, you have auroral signatures of Ganymede as well. So we're going to be able to make measurements of the aurora as we're on the field lines that are actually generating the aurora. Okay, this is what I lose sleep over. So these are the three different, and I think I've got another slide later that goes through this again. These are the three different signatures we're going to have to try and tease out of the data. The one on the left shows you how the background magnetic field changes very slightly 
as a result of these induction currents flowing at Ganymede. And the size of the currents of the fields we're trying to measure there, the changes are of order two to five nanotesla. But this is embedded in a background magnetic field of about 800. So those are changing with time. This middle view here shows you the internal dynamo field of Ganymede, which you add to this. And so somehow you need to find these little signatures with all of this going on. One good thing about the internal dynamo field of Ganymede is it's not changing over time, it's steady. So once you, once you actually model it, you can, you can then be sure it's not changing over time. And then last but not least, you've got the magnetic field of Jupiter hitting into Ganymede and creating all of these currents. So you've got all these currents flowing and those currents are changing. They generate changing fields as well. So you've got two time varying signals you're trying to measure and a non-time varying one. These two here on the right are much bigger than these on the left. So the way I describe it is it's like trying to find needles in a haystack and the needles are changing shape and color all the time. That's what I lose sleep over. The instrument can do it, but we need to get ready so that we can do it. And these red uh, ellipse and circle here shows you what the trajectory of the spacecraft looks like. So right at the end of the mission, we're going to have this 200 kilometer circular phase. We're going to spend at least three months in close orbit around Ganymede. Step back and talk about some of the other things we're going to do at Ganymede. So along the bottom here, just to give you an understanding, this shows you we're actually going to get there about six months after this. So that will be mid 2030 that we get there. Don't ask me how old I'll be. I try not to think about it. Uh, these little blue triangles show you flybys of Ganymede. So we're going to have some early flybys of Ganymede and that's when we're going to confirm the existence of the ocean. This solid blue area shows you the circular orbital phase. So this is the first time a spacecraft is going to go into orbit around a moon other than our own moon. And so I just wanted to list here some of the other things we're going to do at Ganymede. So with the magnetometer and some of the other instruments, and I'll show you how we're going to do that shortly, we're going to characterize the ice shell, work out what the extent of the ocean is and whether it's in touch with the deep interior. We've also got instruments that will be able to determine the global composition and the distribution of material on the surface, but how it's changing over time. We'll look at the surface features, try and understand how they formed and see whether there's any actual activity taking place or whether there might've been past activity. And then, which I've already described to you, we're going to understand how the environment interacts with the um, surface of Ganymede. This is, this is where, we're going to use more than one instrument to understand. So one of the fantastic things about JUICE is we've got 10 different instruments on board. They all do different things, but you're able to get the best science out. You've got to put the data together from all of them. So let's have a look at this. Where shall I start? So we have an instrument that is able to. So what we're looking at here is potential ocean thickness at Ganymede against the thickness of the ice crust. And there is an instrument on board that is able to work out, have a look at deformations of the surface. And so that will then allow us to get an order of magnitude idea about what the potential thickness of the crust is. So that pale blue region would give us boundaries of what we think the thickness of the crust might be. There's an instrument that is able to, to, to have a look at the rotation of Ganymede and whether there are any wobbles to that rotation. That will also help us work out the thickness of the crust. So this gray region here from another instrument will give us other bounds of what the thick crust thickness is. And that will then constrain, based on those two sets of measurements, that will then give us an understanding of an order of magnitude of how thick the crust might, might be. From the, from the signals we're going to be able to measure with the magnetometer instrument, we're going to be able out a range of how thick the ocean is. So from the magnetic induction signals, you can get a range of how thick the ocean is. So that will then set bounds on how thick the ocean is. And if we do this as we orbit, we will also, also get an understanding of what the conductivity of that ocean is. So from the Galileo spacecraft, they didn't spend enough time at Ganymede. And so based on their observations, they couldn't uniquely constrain thickness and conductivity. So they said, let's assume the conductivity is the same as the saltwater oceans on the Earth. That then gave them an idea that the ice, the ocean is of about 100 kilometers in depth. 
So those are the kind of order of magnitude that we're looking at. And if it is a, is a hundred kilometer global ocean, there'll be more water in Ganymede's oceans than there are in the oceans on the earth. So it gives you an idea of the scale. This shows you images of Aurora, which have been taken, were taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of Ganymede. And by being really close, we're going to be able to do much better than that. So the next slide, please. That shows what the field looks like if we add the um, internal dynamo. And then the next one, please. That then shows um, the um, final observations we're going to make, which add everything into account. And I think the next button will show you the orbit. Perfect. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay. One of the other reasons why Ganymede is so important is that we think by understanding Ganymede, which is a water world, we're going to be able to understand a whole class of planetary bodies, which we haven't understood before. And we think that there are many exoplanets which have the same internal structure as this. So by understanding Ganymede, we can understand these water worlds. So by looking at the Jupiter system, we're essentially looking at, at, at essentially three different water worlds, which are Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. But we're also looking at Jupiter, which is a giant planet. And so understanding a new type of planetary body will allow us to get a better understanding about whether there are other water worlds out with exoplanets which have been discovered, whether there's going to be liquid water outside of our solar system as well as inside. And so this was a, another slide that we showed to the European Space Agency as, as part of the case that we made to convince them that we wanted to fly juice. Let's have a little bit of a look of what the internal structure of these water worlds might be. So if an environment is going to be habitable, so if it has the ingredients for life to be able to form, um, and if you have the liquid layers trapped between two icy layers here, then you would expect any organic material would need to be leaking through that icy layer. So this view that we have here is we have a thick ice shell. We then have a liquid, a global liquid water ocean. Then we have another thick ice shelf, and then we have the silicate mantle. We think, we're almost certain that the large moons in our solar system are like this. But one of the things we don't understand is, is this a common habitat in the universe? So if we can understand it better in our own solar system, we will then be able to get a better understanding about what else might be out there. Because really the key question that's driving all of this is are the ingredients there in these water worlds that life might be able to form? But I was very careful when we presented to the European Space Agency, I didn't talk about life. When you talk about life, you expect to see little green people standing on the surface of bodies. And I didn't want them to have that vision. What I wanted them to be thinking about is we're looking for environments where the ingredients are there for life to form, and then we can go back and have a much closer look. So what JUICE is going to do is we're going to be able to characterize Ganymede, and it will constrain for us whether there is likelihood of habitability in our universe. Now, the right-hand view here shows you what we think the interior of Europa is like and potentially what Enceladus, one of the moons of, of Saturn, is like. Um, we think this kind of internal structure is only possible for small, for small bodies, so like Europa and Enceladus, where the um, top of the ice shelf, which is probably quite thin, is in direct contact with the liquid water ocean and the silicate mantle. And so it's so much easier for the silicates to actually make their way to the surface. Um, so one of the things we're going to do at Europa, and I think I've got a slide that talks about this, is we're going to look at active regions on Europa and see whether some liquid and probably some organic material might be coming up out on the surface. And so Europa Clipper, NASA's mission, and JUICE are going to really give us an understanding about where the ice crust is thinnest, because I often get asked, why don't we just send a lander to Europa? But the question is, where would you land? If the, if the ice crust is really thick in one part and you land there, you're never going to get underneath the surface. So we want to try and find where the ice crust is thin. Europa. So it um, shows you what we're going to do at Europa. We've essentially, if you have a look along the bottom, we've got two close flybys of Europa. Um, what these two flybys, and it's quite impressive what two single flybys can do, 
is it will confirm whether there are there is this huge liquid residue underneath the surface. It will uh, allow us to work out whether the salt content is similar to ours. We are going to focus on what are called chaos regions, and this shows you an image from the Galileo spacecraft where we think there's been some recent activity on the surface. Um, we'll be able to work out how thick the ice crust in that in the surface is. And this bullet point here is the moon still active. We weren't sure about that when we presented to ESA, but in fact, the Hubble Space Telescope has now seen outgassing of water vapor plumes from Enceladus. From from Europa, I get confused by my moons. And so by having both Clipper and Juice in the system at the same time, potentially as Clipper's flying by, we'll be able to remotely sense the plumes. This is the strategy we're going to use. We're going to make in situ observations as we fly by. So we're going to measure as we're flying. We're going to have the cameras remotely viewing the surface. We're going to make infrared observations. And we're also going to use ice penetrating radar. And this just shows you what the flyby trajectories look like with the closest approach being at about 350 kilometers. And this is where the cameras are going to be taking image on, images on the surface. But we've seen where we think they're active and we, we will actually fly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Callisto. So Callisto is that moon that we think's got a, well, we know has got a really old surface, old surface, but it's undifferentiated in the interior. And this shows you a view from the Galileo spacecraft of the surface of Callisto. Uh, and this shows you the numerous flybys we're going to make of Callisto. What we're actually doing with Callisto is we're using, using a flyby of Callisto to take us up out of the equatorial plane to put us into higher latitude regions where no spacecraft has been. And so you use the you use the gravitational field of Callisto to get you up out of the equatorial plane. And then these are the three main objectives. We're going to characterize the, the outer shells, including the ocean. We're going to determine the composition of the non-water ice material. So we know on the surface there's water ice, but there's other material as well that uh, the Galileo spacecraft was not able to decipher. We have much better instrumentation on juice, and so we'll be able to work out what's on the surface. And then we're going to look at past activity and try and understand why it isn't differentiated. And this shows you the kind of flyby strategies we're going to have. And it lists on the top left there the different instruments that are going to be able to take data. So we're going to use radio science and laser altimeters. We're going to make in situ observations. We're going to take images. And of course, we're going to use the radar as well. And this shows you the kind of, if you look at a longitude latitude plot of the surface, this is what the orbits are going to be looking like. It would be nice to be covering different parts of the surface, but orbital dynamics mean you need a lot of fuel to do that. So the, the flybys are going to be very similar. Last but not least, um, this is exploring the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And I showed this slide at the public lecture I gave on Tuesday night. This is the top of the, 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 the image on the left. Magnetosphere of Jupiter is huge. If you could see it in the night sky, that would be its size compared to the size of the moon. So it gives you an idea about the, the kind of environment that we're going to. You can see a telescope standing here, but it gives you an idea about how vast the environment is. These little um, triangles show you the closest approaches we're going to make to Jupiter. But we're essentially spending three years in the Jupiter pyramid, and it's going to allow us to understand a lot of the science that I talked about in the earlier slides. I've already talked to you about this. We're going to understand the properties and look at the little mini magnetosphere inside Jupiter's one. And we're also going to look at uh, the auroral signatures. So the way that aurora are generated is you have energetic particles that spiral down the field lines and they then interact with atoms in the atmosphere. And that's how you get these bright lights that you can see. This is the usual auroral oval that you get at the Earth. But here you can also see the footprint from Ganymede and you can see the footprint from Europa as well. I said to you that there's a huge amount of plasma energetic plasma in the equatorial region, which makes the magnetic field lines descend like that. But you also have acceleration taking place. And so you have these field lines reconnecting. And this movie here shows you what happens. 
is you have, as the field lines reconnect, you have plasma being expelled downstream and you've got loss, mass loss taking place as a result. And so Jupiter, Jupiter, juice will be in this environment on many occasions and we'll be able to measure the mass loss as it happens. Next slide, please. Um, the Jovian atmosphere, I'm not an atmospheric scientist, but I do know that we're going to be looking at the Jovian atmosphere. There are a couple of instruments on board that can remotely sense the atmosphere. And the main three uh, things we want to look at is try and get a better understanding of the dynamics and the circulation. We'll be able to better characterize the composition and the chemistry in the atmosphere. And also, not only look at the surface of the atmosphere, but get an understanding about some of the vertical structure as well. But that will all be remote. That will be happening while we're in the magnetosphere of Jupiter. This is my last slide. So this, this shows for me, I think, how much patience one needs to be able to understand planets in the outer solar system. So I'm not suggesting we should be going back hundreds and hundreds of years, but this shows you um, when the Galileo Galilei back in 1610 with his homemade telescope first discovered the moons of Jupiter. He was the first person who saw them through a telescope and they're actually hand-drawn pictures that he made of the four different moons of Jupiter. Then in 1974, the uh, NASA InSight mission went to Mars and saw very clear signs on the surface that there had been liquid water on Mars. Then in 1985, there was uh, uh, some instruments that were put into the very deep ocean depths on the Earth, where the temperatures are incredibly low, the pressures are incredibly high, you'd think nothing would survive, and they saw there was bacteria that survived there, potentially similar kind of um, environment that you would find on some of the moons of Jupiter. Then we had the Galileo spacecraft that orbits around Jupiter and made some of the observations of the moons. We had the Cassini mission that went to Saturn and made its observations. And then in 2012, there was the first discovery of an extrasolar water world, which was made. Now, I describe Juice and Europa Clipper as characterizing these environments. And what we find with these two missions, well, then you can't can't see there, but it says future landing. So what we're going to do with Juice and Clipper is we're going to be able to work where we want to land on these moons in the future so we can actually go under the surface and, and, and see whether there is organic material under the surface. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I wanted to to yeah to 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 understand how how the how how does the uh, the ice withstand the uh, the pressurize the, the the pressurize the pressure from the uh, from from the layers above, uh, and it also if it's is is it is it is it, is it a pure ice or is it mixed with other gaseous material or metal? Will the spray scar be able to detect that and then make a meaningful um, because I mean that's that's what that's a possibility. Um, and then how does the uh, the ice um, uh, is, 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 is influenced by the uh, by the core of the planet? Um, yeah, so so yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Sure, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but I'll give you an idea about how we might want to try and work it out. So you know one of the, one of the strange things is the fact that if you see what we think the internal structure of Ganymede looks like, you've got yeah. you've got the thick ice crust, you then got the liquid water, and then you've got yeah. deeper ice, and you oh. wouldn't think that that was possible. And so okay. we're assuming there's some kind of high pressure, um, something to do with the high pressures that allow you to have ice, water, and then ice. But it's I also see. whether there is a a mix with some kind of material. I don't oh, think yes. we're going to be able to work out what that material is in the deep ice core, yeah. okay. but hopefully okay. we will in the one closer to the surface. Okay, okay. Now that's fair enough. Thank you so much. Okay.